All right. I don't think we'll get them for a little while yet. Braddock hasn't gone yet, so I, I think they're going to be a little while. But uh, we can get this thing started now, and, and they'll show up when they do. Um, okay. So uh, I did confess I did not really get through the PRs this morning. I started late. Um, the only new one I saw when I did scan through the list was the one that, that I've got here. It's a work in progress PR for kind of trying to retune our RocksDB settings uh, with a focus on keeping right amplification at least close to what we currently have it while hopefully both improving performance and, and the big one is improving uh, tombstone behavior. So the performance when we are iterating uh, and especially doing these kind of uh, crazy iterate delete cycles that we tend to do, uh, which RocksDB is really, really bad at. Um, right now, when you do this, you start iterating over tombstones uh, that have not yet been compacted and everything slows way down and becomes awful. So um, right now, it's just some settings that are changing uh, and adding the ability to, to um, use RocksDB's uh, ability to compact on iteration, which they added at some point. I don't know when, but I, I add support for it. Uh, but the, the big piece of this would be to actually track deletes on a per column family basis, and then uh, some locking and trickery to basically, once a transaction has been committed, then uh, increment a counter for the number of deletes that have been successfully committed on a per column family basis, and uh, then only trigger a compaction and a flush for that column family. Uh, and the mem table flush is the one that we don't have anything for right now. Right now, uh, in in mem tables in RocksDB, you can accumulate tombstones, and if you have to iterate over them, there's really no way to fix that sort of doing something like this where you actually track it yourself and then manually issue flushes. So, um, um, Mark? Yes. I think some of the tables, the, um, the use case for Tombstone is, is limited. So object node, there, is, there, there are really few cases when we delete object node. One of them is snap tree. And I mean, deleting on, on mass. The second one, if we do um, um, remove for volume or for collection. Other than that, I don't think we delete many objects. I mean, we could do it from time to time, but the cases that we do it on a large scale is when we delete um, file system, we delete the volume. You're, you're thinking in the, the blue star case, though, but that's not necessarily true for OMAP, right? I'm talking about, about object north now. Uh, I'm yeah, about I'm, talking about OMAP. I'm talking about OMAP, Gabby. Like, we don't have any control. Okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah. OMAP is a different story, but I'm talking about the R -not, object node because that thing also. But, but I think so for the object node, we could trigger the compaction from this. Um, services which tends to be background because deletion of a volume a file system or snap -tering, all of these phases they are not performance critical and so whenever we start finish end we could from time to time just add some code to do the compaction but on the so, normal field we shouldn't see this thing happen so right now we don't expose the ability to do per column family compaction or flushes uh, to outside of the the RocksDB KV store, we could maybe add that, but we end up in the same kind of situation. I think, well, we might be able to avoid locking in that case. But in any event, we don't have that export right now, so we need to add uh, code into RocksDB KV store to let you do a per column family compaction or flush, and then. Still, there's. I'm a little a little nervous about letting people just reach in and kind of issue those themselves. It. I I don't know that we necessarily want that as part of the interface, or if we want the 
the KV store, uh, RxDB KV store code uh, to kind of handle it itself. Um, okay. We, I mean, like the, I guess the fear, right, then is that potentially you've got like multiple things trying to compact at the same time. And like, if, if you- And I'm also worried about compaction happening in the wrong scenario when we do yeah. something important. So what we can do inside the, uh, the, the, the glue code is we could, I think, I think we can do this. I think we can basically register a listener with RocksDB to say, I want to know when this column family has been compacted and when like a compaction event ends. And then if we are tracking deletes, we can basically reset the delete counter if a, another compaction comes in behind the scenes that we don't know about and kind of make this fairly clever. Um, I don't know if it all will work or not, but that's kind of the, the current thinking I had is we can basically increment our delete counter, issue a flush or a compaction, depending on some criteria, whatever it is, you know, however many deletes that we want that have finished successfully based on, on you know, knowing that the transaction finished. And then we register a listener with RocksDB so that if RocksDB decides to compact the column family, then we don't just do it ourselves, you know, blindly. We, we reset our counters based on, on that and then re start re-incrementing them. Um, so that then, you know, we, we wait until more deletes have happened because if Roxy compacts, then all the tombstones are gone. Does that, does that kind of make sense, Gabby? Yes, it does. I think if we wanted to do it the other way, we'd have to expose both the ability to do per fault column family flushes and compactions and then also pass through the ability to register register listeners with RocksDB, and that gets I mean it gets kind of messy. Then you're starting to like expose a lot of internal details about RocksDB to BlueStore, where you know, theoretically this should be an abstraction, which you can do. It just I don't know. It's starting to feel kind of gross. At least that's my take on it. Okay. All right, so um, in general though, uh, that's all still work in progress and um, you know, I, we'll, we'll find out what's right or if any of this actually works or, or what, I guess. Um, but we probably need to fix it in multiple different ways uh, and, and just try things. Um, okay, so next updated from uh, Igor. Uh, this is uh, uh, get rid of status updates on each transaction. Um, this failed QA. That was the deal with this one. I think Adam had approved it. He got some updates. Um, I think Adam actually maybe wrote some fixes for this, uh, but I didn't look too closely at it. So anyway, it's it's being worked on. Um, and then after that, I confess I didn't really get through the the old PRs. Uh, it's possible some of these got updated, but um, I most of them are probably still kind of just hanging around. So, um, in terms of status updates this week, uh, the RocksDB tuning thing got posted. Uh, So if folks are interested, the, the final version is out there. Um, Josh, we we talked a little bit about this in the PR, but um, you had mentioned uh, right amplification as a really as a concern about uh, using TTL. And um, one of the things in this article that I saw is that with RGW, the write workload in RocksDB went way down when we started, when I started testing compression. Um, it was it was huge. Um, you know, there are downsides, right? Because it's probably more CPU overhead, almost assuredly more CPU overhead. And it did seem to impact bucket listing performance, especially in CPU limited scenarios. But, um, but for RGW, it, it looked like it was a huge write amplification win. 
And yeah, um, I can't remember if I mentioned this in the past. We actually did run compression in two of our RGW clusters um, internally, and I found that was mostly fine until um, those OSDs became a backfill source. Um, at which point the load spike was pretty significant. Um, Interesting. Because of the high read traffic. Um, and we actually did get some people with workload slowdowns when that happened. Now, I'm okay. sure there's things that could be done to tweak that, right? It's not like we have to backfill at full speed, but it, it was noticeable. Do you remember if you were using snappy compression or um, uh, LZ4? It was, snap. it was snappy. Okay, okay. I think they're pretty close, although I think LC4 was a little better um, from what I saw on the, the Rocks TV Facebook thing, um, and then also just in in testing. Um, yeah, and to be clear, the right app that I'm concerned about is less so on the index side. Like that six-hour TTL, that was based off of our um, tweaking to find an acceptable right app. So basically, it's like, okay, assume you want your SSD to last for five years. We just did the math on write app and everything was fine. We've got tons of write capability on those boxes, so it wasn't a performance issue. It was entirely a wear level issue. Yeah. But let's say you've got like, you know, 14 tebibyte QLC drives backing your data store for an RCW workload with a high object count. That's where I start to get concerned about yeah. what the write app is going to do to the drive. And I have a feeling that all of this stuff is going to increase RAMP overall, right? Like the TTL, the the compact on iteration, especially if you start tracking deletes and that like every, you know, thousand or 10,000 or who knows what deletes we, we issue compactions, you know, we're, we're going to see that RAMP go up. So I'm just trying to think of like how to, how to kind of start balancing some of this out. Um, well, and this is, the, this is the balancing act with Ross TV, right? Yeah. So, yep. like, I, I was super, as a, I'm just catching up. I actually just came back from three and a half weeks of PTO here, but I did see someone, one of my teammates had seen your PR and posted it. And I'm super happy to see a lot of those settings starting to be proposed for mainline rather than saving a blog post somewhere. That's awesome. Um, I think for most people, it's just not going to matter. And then for the larger shops like us or others, um, we're probably just going to observe carefully and then tweak it ourselves anyway. Yeah. Right. So like yeah. if the right app's unacceptable, we'll just go and walk back like the TTL setting or something, right? To make it work for our, our use case. So Yeah, yeah. If if you can handle iterating over more tombstones, if it's not really causing you a problem, you could you could, you know, back those off somewhat or or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And like the, a, a lot of the I mean, it also will make a difference once we're in multiple column families, like we're still on the oh. offering to Pacific, right? And that okay. makes a huge difference. We actually, so um, I don't know if you saw, came across uh, your way at all, but uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Alex Maragon, I'm sure you know who he is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we had tracked down uh, PG log bloat issue, um, which I don't think we're the first ones to hit. And the PG log bloat basically caused the PG log to be many, many gigabytes in size on a per OSD basis. And it actually caused RocksDB to fall into having an L5. Four data <laughs> and that was awful because now your yeah. tombstone build up just is that much bigger, right? So the more yeah. families you have, the fewer tombstones you have because things get compacted out more regularly. We actually had to yeah. recondition those OSDs because they were non-performant after that point in time. Was was that uh, issue that you hit the um, the one where uh, we are failing to trim if there is a bogus? Um, Basically, like future update that ends up getting in. Uh, that was no, this, was this was each entry was getting big. Oh, that one. Okay. Yeah, yep. yeah, because of like the ref count updating uh, PG log entries. Like the every PG log entry was like 20 kilobytes plus or something like that, just for a ref count update. I, I don't remember the details, Hopefully. but it was huge. And it's like it yeah. goes back to some like hammer error, hammer era change, where yeah. like I don't I don't know exactly how it works. It's, this one actually now I'm, I'm it's actually a dupe entry issue is um, was where if you have a corrupt dupe entry that looks like it's in the future then we just don't trim anything and you oh, end up with like we're millions of that one very closely yes yeah, yeah I don't know if that's landed for Pacific yet but we're backporting it yeah I, I, we went through and we we're doing a bunch of work on that a week or two ago and that's that the fix is good um, so 
yeah, that should that should hopefully no longer be an issue. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, I guess um, I will be very interested in uh, your guys' take on this, and especially if you guys have any kind of like test set up when we get the the deletion like deletion tracking if we get that in i'd be very very interested in having you guys review it and if you can you know make sure it's, it's not blowing anything up on your end <laughs> for sure yeah i mean we do have test setups i'll have to see because of the way they hook into the infrastructure i'll have to see whether they would trigger those paths or not um so i mean we'll see once the pr is up how they integrate we might have to tweak how we do our testing um, the okay. reality is, like, most of our test setups are not particularly reflective of, like, the vast, um, uh, I don't know, I'm still catching up. I find when I catch up for vacation, like, words just don't come to my head as quickly as they do. <laughs> but, like, there's, like, there, there's a huge, there's a huge um, array of customer workloads, and it's very hard for us to capture that perfectly. So, usually, once we're yeah. here, it's not going to fall over. Our best test is, let's just go and put it in production for a subset and find out what happens. So. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Once once the code is available, and once we're sure it's like tested well enough, we can at least put it in our staging rig. Happens. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. Definitely appreciate your guys's. Uh, uh, you know, Alex's uh, tracker ticket that he made kind of uh, really, really highlighted it. I think. I don't know if I would say it. I, we we had we've we've known about how bad tombstone accumulation is for a couple of years now, but, um, but you know, it's, it's worse, I think, than we even realized. So. It, it, I mean, it, it, that was basically documenting our similar journey, right? We knew it was bad too. We were just kind of suffering through it. And then we realized how bad it was and something about it. Yeah. Yeah. Monk, regarding tombstone, I think the problem might be mitigated. If we change the way we access RocksDB, I don't yeah. think a tombstone is a real issue when you access an object by key. Because I think we did the math. So say yeah. you have one million object and you deleted the object thousand times. So now you have one billion tombstone and one million object. Are you with me? You had one million object, but after thousand deletion cycle you now got one real one million of real object and one billion of tombstone let's assume there was no compaction whatsoever okay are you with me so far so until now yeah. okay so until now when you did a search for an object which is done by login it was taking 20 steps for 1 million object, log n of 1 million is 20, so 20 steps. When you grow to billion object because of other tombstone, the search going to take 30 steps because log 2 of 1 billion is 30. So we really only increased the work that we do by 50%. And that when we had crazy amount of tombstones, so that's not a problem. The problem is when people walk on range, because then they start searching. And when you search, then you are linearly affected by the amount of tombstone. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, I agreed. Um, I don't know for sure, but I think when you access something by key, RocksDB internally will go through and hit the bloom filters, right, to see if that key exists in a particular level. And if it can't, if it has to, it will fall back to doing a a search through the the uh, SST files. Is that right, Kevin? Is that your understanding too? Yeah, but before I'm talking about the main table itself. The oh. search in the main table yeah. is done log in, which is pretty cheap. So, so so the problem I think with Tombstone is really when you do linear pass on the on the table. Because yeah, I generally agree. It will end time bigger. It's it's so the it's the really um range. when we search by range, that is a terrible thing to do. We should never search by range. 
Yeah, and we do. Actually, it's the, lo but it's, it's, the it's the lower bound and the upper bound that are really slow, right? That's what we saw in testing. Yeah, yeah. I, I suspect that search by range is terrible even without tombstone. We shouldn't be doing ranges. The code should be just accessing one object at a time. You have looked at. I mean, you've, Gabby, you've looked at a lot of this code more than I have, like with the snap mapper. So, I mean, what what can we do there? Like, in I know you're keeping the whole thing in memory right now, um, yes. but what, what's your long-term plan? So, in the snap mapper, there was really no reason to search by ranges, but the way this thing was built forced us to walk by ranges because we wanted to have a logic map from snap ID to a set of objects. So you can have one snap ID and say 20,000 objects. <clears throat> what we have done is we broke it into 20,000 separate key, key value. Each time the key was the snap ID and the object ID. So now we start searching by ranges. So all the searches are done by ranges and that is extremely expensive. So all of this is going to go away with my code because we no longer use OMAP, RocksDB whatsoever. And I also think that my code is now going through some kind of optimization um, cycles because I realized that a lot of what we do is doing worst case scenario, but we never really use this code. Um, for example, <clears throat> when we, the way that we call the code, we have an option we call update, and the update gives you the old, so if the clone object was mapped to three snap sessions, and now you remove one or two snap, so it gives you the new map and tell you, you have to remove all, everything from the old maps. So in theory, you should walk over all the snaps and remove all the stuff. But in reality, this is not how we do things. In reality, what we do is that we remove one snap session at a time. We only walk on a single snap session. So you only need, and when, you add object, when you're adding object, that's a very simple thing. Just add the object and you can patch them to disk. When you do trimming, you do it on a single snap. So you just need to page this single snap map into memory. Maybe you need to sort it. I don't know. Does it make sense that when you remove, if you order the object, does that, is it that cheaper? when you do removing order, or does it make no sense? Say I have to remove 1,000 objects. Is, is it important to have them done in order, or is it so? In what order? I don't know, by the, by, by, by the object ID order? If you remove something from the object node, uh, um, column family, is, does it make any difference if you do them in one order, if you do them randomly? I believe the only scenario is PG removal, and uh, it doesn't matter for right in, in which. Uh, okay, if it doesn't matter, then all we need to do is page this single snap entity into memory, and then remove them one by one, and you just walk over a vector. It's an extremely simple thing, and you never have to do any searches. You never have to do any sorting any accesses to database and anything else. If you remember that the way that we do things, it's one snap at a time. We don't, the code in theory can support <clears throat> operating multiple snap and removing multiple objects for multiple snaps, but we never do that. Actually, I take it back. There is one scenario in which we do that, but that scenario is not critical. That scenario is, um, when you remove a volume, then you need to remove the object from all the sessions. But that thing is low priority and it could be done easily. 
But the way that we do snap trim is always one snap at a time. But the code is always operating as if everything could be modified in any time. And it's always iterating over all the snap when, we, in fact, we always work on a single snap. So this whole code is very general, which is a nice thing if it's, I don't know, if you try to build a toolkit for somebody else. It's nice to be general. But when you're doing stuff for yourself, it's okay to say, you know what, we're going to remove snap sessions one by one. We start from one session, once we're done, we move to the next one. There is really never a reason to work on multiple sessions. So then the code is much easier to do, and it's much cheaper. So that's the way to do things. But the, the, the other cases when we do range, I know in PG log, we try to do range remove. I suspect that's another problem. I think in the end we decided not to do that. In theory, range remove is a cheap operation because instead of issuing multiple tombstones, you just create one mega tombstone. In reality, it seems to be more expensive. And, and, and I don't know, there's, there might be other cases where we, on OMAP, that we work by ranges. I suspect that we do that quite much on RTW. And then we need to think if there's a way to avoid doing that. Ranges is, working by ranges is very expensive. It's easy to write the code like this, but that requires linear, linear or near linear searching. Yeah, I, I agree, Gabby. I think the more we avoid it, the, the the less important some of this other stuff becomes that that we're talking about with like you know, automatically triggering compaction and flush on deletion and that kind of thing um, just to try to get tombstones out I don't know if we're ever really going to completely eliminate it though I don't know like on the RGW side Casey do you know like under what circumstances we we do a lot of like range based iteration I don't know, but there, there might be some other cases. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how bucket listings work. I'm pretty sure, since Casey's not talking. Yeah, right. Greg, do you know it's... Oh. Just listing OMAP keys and iterating over them. And is that the only case that we do is with bucket listing, or do we have anything else lurking where we're doing a lot of base range scans? I mean, I'm sure there's others, but that's a pretty important one. Like that's that needs to work we can't replace it with something else we like we need that functionality the alternative is maintaining another index of rgw entry like objects and then we just have this problem all over again but at our a higher layer that can't do anything any better with it yeah greg i'm i'm kind of trying to get a sense for like how important a general solution is to in like the rocks db store for issuing compactions on deletion to get rid of tombstones versus more like one-off kind of, you know, allowing different things to issue compactions periodically. Like, do we need the general solution or is it good enough to have like the ability to let something trigger a compaction here and there? I, I don't have a good sense of the trade-offs. I don't even talking about it, but I haven't been following enough of the other details. It, I mean, like... My inclination is a general solution, basically in the, the RocksDB uh, KV store code. You basically, for every column family, track the deletions and then have some cleverness there where we can um, reset our counters when RocksDB issues a background compaction and not expose the ability to do like per column family compaction and flushing to other stuff. We just take care of it there. That's kind of my yeah, inclination. Yeah, I mean, because... <laughs> Like like the upper layers that are even if they're doing both delete both deletes like they don't know where they're going. Generally. Yeah. Like 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 they're not paying attention to what PG things are in. They're certainly not paying attention to which OSD gets those PGs, um, and that all matters I think for this. Yeah. But like yeah. you know, 
like the MDS stores all of its D entries in OMAP, then, you know, sure, it can do a bulk delete of OMAP sometimes. It's not super common, but like if it does, if it deletes five directories, it doesn't, it doesn't know if they're all in one PG or one OSD or like what got or what. So it's not. Yeah. And I mean, like even inside the OSD and inside Blue Store, I don't really want it, you know, people thinking about RocksDB internal behavior, right? Like that's, if we, we we won't, but if we did put a different, you know, key value store behind this, issuing compactions on deletion might not be what you want to do at all. So it's, I think the the key, key value store code is, or the RocksDB key value store code is where this probably should live. Sure, makes sense to me. I mean, I think you, if you want to track that, like if, if you want to issue it based off the, the ratio of deleted, or tombstones, then that, there's no reason to do that above Rock TV or our direct Rock TV handling because, like, why would you? Rock TV knows, or we know where the where the deletes came from. I I think that Gabby's idea earlier was that we could kind of try to be smart about like waiting until there's like no a, a time period to do a compaction when nothing else is happening. Like maybe there's a trade off that you want to make. Where you don't want to do the compaction immediately, you just want to wait for a while. But I, I don't think it's enough of a win. Yeah, we don't have a lot of that kind of downtime that we know about. Gabby, did I, did I say your position right? I think that's what you were arguing, right? So I was thinking about the cases where we know that we can stop whatever we do. So if we do snap tree, we could stop the trim until compaction is done. There is no reason to run them in parallel. If we do sure, we um, trim, volume deletion, anything of, else, <laughs> then you could stop. Yeah, I know, but at least you could stop this thing, which is clearly generating more tombstone in the same column family. What I mean, what does stopping the snap trim get us? Like when, like, like I think, are you saying you would want to stop the compaction until the snap trim is done and you can do all the tombstones at once? I, I don't understand. No, the other way around. So if you do snap trim, for example, and snap trim is generating a lot of tombstone, then internally it knows, you know, I generated that many tombstone. Let's stop trimming, compact the tombstone and go back to trimming. Won't you Wouldn't you stop you rather... it because it will no, it block? Would... And wouldn't you rather have all the tombstones get in that you can and do them all at one go? Like, you're going to have to go all the way through either way. I don't I don't think running more compactions during a snap no, is better. No, I don't the way through. I could stop. Comp so trimming it can go over, I don't know, if you trim one volume, you, you could end up removing hundreds of thousands of objects. And each when one you of say volume, do you mean an RBD image? What? What, what do you mean by volume? No, if you do snap trim, for example, that could generate a lot of tombstone. So the best thing for you to do is, I don't know, every thousand tombstone, every 10,000 tombstone, every 100,000, you pause the snap trim, run compaction, and only when it's done, you could resume compaction, uh, snap trim. That does not square with my intuition of compact compaction and tombstones interact, but maybe you have tests I have looked at tests I haven't. I mean yeah. like, like you have to like the more if you run compaction then issue a bunch more tombstones, you just have to go through all the layers again. And you're not like and, and I don't think you're reducing the the number of levels by that much. Greg, I, I think the, 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 the case that I really worry about deleting or you're, or well not at the same time, but you're interleaving them, right? That's the one that, that we consistently see break where you have lots of tombstones, you're not writing anything, so you're never compacting, so you end up with iteration just taking longer and longer, like you know, like um uh 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 you know, seeking to the beginning of a range or, or seeking to the end of the range. That's that's the behavior that we've we've got to 
figure out how to um, fix. Okay. I mean, Gabby's, I think, at least for the snap map, are trying to figure out how to just get rid of the, the seek behavior entirely, which is great if we can, but, you know, we can't do that for yes, buckets and dexes. we can do that, but yeah. I'm saying why we do that. We know that we generate a lot of tombstone for others, and since we can stop doing that. So in, in theory, if you run snap map very quickly, you would fill the system with tombstone. So you should, in a way, pace yourself, say, you know what? Every end tombstone I create, I'm going to take a break, compact the system, and only then I resume compact uh, trimming or, or, or volume remove or whatever it is I do. Well, you don't you don't have to take a break, right? Because it, when a compaction is triggered, you'll block and you'll you'll take a break regardless if you want to, right? I think logically it's nicer to to to, to look at my code as taking some steps step. step and yeah, taking brackets means my code is not consuming resources, waiting for something to happen. Ah, I see, in memory or whatever. Um, but if you're only working on like one thing at a time, is it? Are you consuming a lot of resources if you if you end up blocking? Do you have like a lot of memory? It's, yeah, if it's one at a time, then probably not. But I work on one at a time, but I'm generating more all the time. So even if I do one each time, there, there could be like out, the number of outstanding could be growing and growing. Because it's, I don't think the thread is going to be blocked on this. I'm just going to generate more and more work. You won't, uh, you're, 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 you're just submitting more work without bound, if it's, even if it's not completing? Yes, I think so. But that I probably might should, might there should be a limit there, probably, <laughs> right? I, 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 might, I might be wrong here. I, I'm, okay. not, I'm not sure about what happened in this code. Right, but I mean, the reason that tombstones are bad is because they inflate the level size, right? Or the, the level depth, right? So, you, like, if you're doing an iteration, you have to go however many levels deeper to to see if there's that, something there. Greg, that's not as part of it, but the big, the real part of it is that you, when you're sort of like, you know, finding the beginning of a range, um, it you end up going over and having to iterate all, over all of those two stones to do it. So like, as you go into, if you're doing this kind of like, iterate, find something, delete it, start over at the beginning again, iterate, find, delete it, you end up doing, uh, you know, it's not like a linear growth, it's it's a, a bigger growth no, in terms of... It is probably linear growth, but if you do your step and time, then you have to multiply it by n. Yeah. Right, so if your step is... It's n times n. m. Yeah. But now n is... I don't know, you got 4N, 5N, 6N, so it's just growing and growing. Sorry, I, and I, yeah, I, I think I don't know enough here, because like, sure, you find a thing that's tombstone, but that just, what do you mean, then you delete, have to delete it? Like, no, you it's, that we it's... restart our iteration when, when we hit a tombstone? No, we restarted our iteration for every in, 10, in the, things. In the code that we use for snap trim, we, rest, oh, we restart the iteration for every two objects that we delete. Okay. That's, it's a very expensive iteration. Okay, I mean, yeah, so that seems like something we should work on. Um. Because, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I don't know what all the patterns are, but, I mean, from just a how much work it takes to do the compaction and, and propagate things, then, you know, having all the tombstones in there at once means we have to do one pass when we come back. And doing it every thousand, if we have 20,000 tombstones, it means we have to do tw 20 compaction passes. And that's, that seems bad, too. So, I, I guess, yeah, we should look at our iteration patterns. Um, we don't really want to have to, like, 
stop iterating. Like we can't remove all iteration from the no, system. No, of course but... we don't remove all, but, <laughs> but like we do, example... we do control everything that does iteration, or at least you know everything we care about. I guess maybe some Liberados users, but um... yeah, we I think we need fallback code because we can't have everything just kind of grind to a halt. But generally speaking, if we can especially if we can avoid restarting and re you know like recomputing a lower bound right like uh that's that's what a lot of times we see is that rocksdb is spending like a horrific time amount of like wall clock time seeking within lower bound because we're restarting over and over again do we do we know what patterns causing that is that i i don't remember the snap mapper code well enough to have any idea but like is that a thing that rtw is doing or I, I could be wrong on this, but I think maybe the iterator becomes invalid with the delete. Does that sound right? No, it's simply uh, a matter of scoping. Right. There's no there's no preservation of iteration between different calls. So each time you're creating a new iterator, you're calling into the snap mapper to get the next objects to look at. Okay. I, I would suggest that in this case, doing a big iteration for, say, I don't know, 100 object, and then internally looping over them would significantly improve the way the code is working in the presence of, of Tombstone. But still, it would be still expensive, but it would be less expensive. For what it's worth, too, this isn't just a step mapper. Oh, yeah, that probably the reason for that is that we have to lock the objects, so we don't want to like block I/O on a large chunk of them. That's probably why it's two at a time. Yeah, I mean, you could just search, use this thing, but you don't need to process them, or you could still process them one by one, but just the search just get a hundred objects each time. And the search should not be expensive. If the search is expensive, then something is wrong here. I mean, removing the object, all the processing, all the transaction, that's expensive. But if even the search is expensive, that you say, I cannot do it for that long, then you are actually making it worse. Sure, you, you never block it for a very long time, but Aggregated, you will block it for much bigger time. In general, the smaller, more frequent compaction strategy has been applied pretty successfully in other variants of RoxDB, like Pebble and other academic papers. Um, so I think, yeah. I think that is worth looking into. Yeah, Josh, that's kind of why I'm I'm leaning towards this this plan of tracking deletes, uh, on a, you know, per column family, and then just you know, we we can tweak it, but generally speaking, issuing issuing compaction. I'm afraid of the right amplification overhead. But we probably are going to inc increase right amplification doing this, but I I think probably from a the whole system working well kind of uh, yeah, perspective. Yeah. It will it will improve things. Exactly. We uh, consistent latency is much more important than amplification if we have like ridiculously high latencies resulting from this. Otherwise, yeah. And it really is deletes, right? You know, in tombstone accumulation, like everything else seems like it more or less works pretty well. It's it's that that one piece that really causes mm -hmm. us problems over and over. Yeah, exactly. So what what's your idea exactly with the delete counter? It's like counting up the number of deletes and then manually compacting a, a particular column family? Yeah, it gets tricky, but the, the gist of it is um it's probably going to involve locking, which I don't love, but uh, we have a, basically like a column family wrapper thing that's got a bunch of, well, a couple of different counters in it. 
we increment our counters when we issue arm key or arm keys or whatever we're, we're doing, but we don't actually apply what we increment until the transaction completes the RocksDB. Then once we have that particular counter get high enough, we issue a compaction and, and we maybe have a separate set of counters for flushing because flushing the mempable is the one thing that we really don't have any control over right now, uh, as far as I can tell, and no one else that uses RocksDB does either, short of this kind of a method of tracking deletes. Um, we don't want to issue a compaction or a flush if RocksDB did so recently. So in addition to this, we would, I believe we can do this, register a listener with RocksDB so that uh, for each column family, so each column family would basically have a listener associated with it for, or each wrapper would have for, for a column family would have a listener for its column family associated with it that then would um, listen for flush and delete or flush and, and compassion completion events, and we would reset our counters if RocksDB is doing its own compaction or flush, so that we don't issue one immediately after it's done it. Does that does that sound reasonable? Yeah, I think so. Um, I guess I, I wonder if the um, the listening for for compaction and, and events and um, flush events seems like a May or may not. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not necessary. Are you sure that is? Yeah, that would probably be a, a. It could just be an enhancement, right? I mean, it's not the end of the world if you do a compaction immediately after RocksDB just did one. Um, it's not great, but. Um, I mean, how we run our RocksDB compactions with, without without our intervention? It depends on what the right workload looks like. You know, if you're on NVMe drives and, and you're pushing a really heavy write work workload, it can be extremely frequent, um, like, you know, every second or two. Um, I guess with these, like, delete heavy workloads, it seems like they're not, it's not compacting that fast or that quickly to keep up with the ingest. Correct. Right? Correct. With the delete workloads, you're, you're I, I don't know if eventually we'll trigger compaction if you literally fill the mem table full of deletes if like there's some extremely small size associated with that, that tombstone. I guess I would assume there is. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it's either never compacting or just compacting extremely. Um, okay, so you're, what you're saying is, is implies that um, some is, tra is tracking when it takes compact based on fullness and because tombstones are small, they're not getting to that fullness very quickly. Yeah, or just never, right? We don't. I don't actually know, but yeah. Um, the so the, the the potentially the bad case, right, would be if you've got a um, some kind of like moderate or small write workload, and then like a a delete workload mixed in with it, and the writes are triggering compactions, but then we're also triggering wow. compactions and deletes, and you end up like kind of like colliding with each other. And have like twice the number of of compactions you maybe should have, right? Because they're they're kind of stepping on each other's feet. Sure, sure. That would be you know the thing that you'd maybe want to try to listen for and avoid. But like you said, it's it's probably not the end of the world. It would mean more right amplification and maybe a little slower. But the 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 big thing is actually the deletes, tracking the deletes, and um, then applying what you see on successful transaction to RocksDB to the you know successful write of the transaction to the Red Hat log, and then uh, issuing the compaction just on, and the flush the flush and the compaction only for that column family if you see however many deletes you you want to trigger on. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And that way we also avoid compacting the entire database because we don't want to do that. We only want yeah. to do it on the com family that's that's got the least present. Would it be worthwhile to can think about um, a smaller range within a column family too, or would that not help? I haven't thought about it that that far, but um, you can you can do like a range for compaction.
I don't know. So you're thinking like, okay, we know we can set the the lower and upper bound for this range based on the, the keys that we've deleted. Uh, that's your thought. Or maybe um, longer term, we could we could like if if we see compaction takes is taking a very long time for the full column family, we could try to reduce the uh, scope of it. Sure. Presumably, this would make more frequent compaction events that are somewhat shorter. Right. Not, not linearly so, but somewhat shorter with an overall increase in right amplification because it's not linear. Mm -hmm. That's what and I expect that, to see. Can you flush the mem tables with a range as well, or is it just everything? I don't know. I know you can flush them. I don't know what you what, what options they give you. Mm -hmm. If you can find out quick. Yeah, I guess I, I guess the range part is probably less important for the mem tables. Is it's purely writing it, bring this into the first double. Flush is called with a flush options data structure. Is flush options. There is this. Just trying to see if this flush options thing has the ability to give a range. Options T. Oh, this is like Rust documentation. Oh, I don't know if I want to be in here. Um, I guess this is what this thing looks like in Rust. <laughs> uh, it's it's yeah. <laughs> so you do get like from into try from try into borrow borrow. Yeah, it's not a lot of uh, English to. We can look into that more another time, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it's probably not worth trying to do this. Um, so, yeah, maybe. But we, we don't need to do it to start out, right? We can start out just yeah. trying to flush yeah. the whole thing. So, yeah, I've kind of been trying to lay it out in my head, and I it, it seems like it all works. I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to protect the... Um, the uh, wrapper thing with the lock on on deletion um when you delete sorry when you're like arm key or you know whatever um sure but because it's I just think we, counter right or yeah is it more than that well maybe a couple counters right but still nothing major like no there shouldn't really be any blocking code in, in inside the lock so 
Any other point could, could it be? Would it be? You know, could be be an atomic variable? I was thinking the other day it couldn't be. Um, but I'll, let me think about it again. I haven't, okay. I haven't thought about it in a couple of days. <laughs> Except I had that same thought, Josh. Is that maybe yeah, yeah. atomics? But I, I think it didn't work. Um, okay. So yeah, anyway, I'll I'm gonna try to take a look at that once a lot of these other like random fires get put out that that we have right now with performance stuff. But uh yeah, that's that's kind of the plan for me anyway to see if we can do this. Um yeah, I guess that's that's it. Um and we're at the end of the hour. Did, did anyone else have anything they wanted to talk about this week before we wrap up? All right. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. It was a really good year. Oh, go ahead, Gabby. No, I'm just asking if Josh could contact me after the meeting. Oh, sure. Okay, thanks. All right, cool. Well, then, have a great week, everyone. Thanks for coming. See you next week. Thanks. See you later. Bye.